Welcome back for part three. At the end of our previous video, we had a circle drawing uh, on a web page thanks to P5JS. Today, let's get the keyboard and mouse interaction side of things set up and working and kind of just explore a little more about what P5JS is all about uh, and some more fundamentals of JavaScript. So a function is just a, um, a way of grouping pieces of instruct of programming code together. So we have uh, a group of instructions called setup where we've just get it to do one thing at the moment, create a canvas. And we have a group of instructions called draw. Once we kind of make all of our different groups, we can even have groups call other groupings of code right and it so it gives us a way of organizing our code put it into logical organized chunks um, so that it doesn't become too unwieldy the syntax for creating functions uh, for our purposes for now will, will always look like this it's the word function all in lowercase a space whatever name we're going to give it um, the um, open and close round uh, parentheses and then the curly braces inside the curly braces contains all of our programming instructions uh, we might end up putting some parameters inside some functions we'll deal with that when the time comes now p5js in particular expects to see a function called setup and a function called draw and the way that p5js uses these is that when the web page when the web browser loads the page, it will run the setup function and do whatever's in there. It'll do that once, and then it'll run the draw function continually. So it, it's redrawing this circle many times per second on the screen. And in fact, we will specify the frame rate that we want it to do so uh, in a little while. Uh, and so this just keeps on running again and again and again. Um, it hits the bottom at the end of the, the block of instructions and then um, P5JS will tell draw to start again and it will just keep on going. Okay, so that's that's where we have to put kind of all of our game logic um, resides within draw. Setup is just as it sounds like it, it sets everything up. Although we will have another function called preload that we will use later on as well. So I'm going to add another instruction to my setup called frame rate. So this is the speed at which we want our game to run. Uh, and so right now I'm just going to say 15 frames per second um, is an adequate enough speed for what I want for our purposes. And let's create some variables to make our circle move across the screen, shall we? Now, unfortunately, I mean, this isn't this is an ideal programming practice to demonstrate <laughs> this, but anyway, um, a number of the variables we're gonna create are, are gonna be what's known as globals. Uh, so they're gonna be de de defined up here at the top of our code. Uh, and that means that all the functions can access them. Um, and so normally you would, as much as possible, you create a, a variable inside a function and so that it only exists in, in inside the lifetime of that function. Um, but because we want things to continually keep getting reaccessed uh, by different functions, we're going to have to have quite a few globals. Um, but anyway, uh, so what is a variable? A variable is just a thing that we're asking the, com the programming language to remember for us. So it could be the person's name. Right now, it's going to be the X and the Y coordinate of where we want the circle to be drawn um, as it keeps redrawing at 15 times a second. So I'm going to create a couple of variables. Um, we're going to, these are only temporary. We're going to change them uh, in a little while. Um, well, I'd, actually, let's, let's go with the names that I, we're going to stick with, shall we? So to, to create a variable, I use the word let, and then I, I create my variable name. Now, for all the global variables, so that you can distinguish between what's a global variable and what is just within the functions. I am going to use a 
naming scheme whereby all my global variables are all caps, all uppercase um, letters. So I'm going to call this player underscore X and I'm going to set it to a, a starting position of um, 100. Okay, and then let player Y. Okay, so let player Y exist and give it a starting value of 100. Let player, uh, yeah, player X and let player Y exist and give it a starting value of 100. All right, and so then down here, my little circle command, instead of just the number 200, I'm going to say, okay, instead of using this number, I want you to look up whatever I asked you to remember inside player X and inside player Y. And then we can actually change these values and it, that will change our circle, right? And therefore have the effect of making it, make it look like our circle is moving, right? What, what's actually happening is it's been drawn in different places um, 15 times a second. So for instance, if I take player X, let me, let me write this line of code and then explain what's going on. Okay, so take the variable player X and update its value, all right? So this is not uh, a math style equation. This is saying, take whatever the value is that's on the right and place it in the thing on the left, all right? In the same way that we did it here, player X equals, let this thing exist and set it to that. So here I'm now saying, okay, take whatever was in, take player X, and now I want you to set it to this. What do I want you to set it to? I want you to set it to whatever used to be or is currently in player X until I run, run this command and add one to it. So do this math, look up the number 100, add one to, to it, it'll become 101. That This bit of code will resolve to the 101 the first time and then make player X equal to 101. All right, so it'll do that uh, and then it'll come back up, draw the circle a second time where player X is at 101 and then it'll run this code again, 101 plus one, player X will turn into 102 and, and so on and so on. All right, so if I save this and look at what's happening, we can see here, I'm getting a whole bunch <laughs> Uh, it looks like I'm leaving a trail, but what's actually happening is I'm drawing a circle on top of a circle on top of a circle on top of a circle, and I'm just changing the X coordinate each time. That's all well and good, but what happens if I just want a circle without the trail? Well, it means I need to clear the background each time. So I'm going to come back to my P5JS reference. I hope you still have that open because we're going to be using it a lot. And if I type background, right and come to the background page we can see that we can set background to different colors we can give it a grayscale value we can give it an rgb color code we can give it a color name we can use the um, hex color codes right um, but if you're going to use the hex color codes you've got to have little quotes on each side of it because they, they are technically what's known as a string that we'll talk about later on. Um, and we can also use images for backgrounds and we'll do all that later on. Uh, so for now, let's, you know, like if I wanted to do, take this as my background, select it, copy it. Uh, let's go back to my VS code, all right? I can now in here just type background. Hang on, is it uppercase or lowercase g? It's all lowercase, okay and paste that in and save and go back to my web browser and let's take a look at what's going on All right because i'm drawing the background every frame and then drawing a circle on top of that All right that back by redraw by drawing that background it has the effect of erasing what was previously there All right so i still drew that previous circle it's just then i draw a whole pink background on top of it and then I draw another circle and then a pink background and then another circle and then a pink background and then another circle. Okay, hopefully you're still with me. Uh, I'll, let's make our circle, instead of just slowly drag along, let's make it move according to the keyboard. 
So what I'm going to do here now is um, instead of this, I'm going to introduce you to the key, is key down function. So if I've got, um, so I'm going to use ASDW, right? And if I'm pressing the A key, I want to move left. If I'm pressing the D, I want to move right. If I'm pressing W, let's move up. If I press S, let's move down. Okay. So that means I need to know which key I'm pressing. And I want to do different things based upon which key is being pressed. So we use what's known as an if statement to tell our programming code only if this thing is true, do this group of instructions. All right. And so the way an if statement works is I type if and then we have a set of round parentheses and a set of curly braces again all right uh, you, javascript loves brackets <laughs> so inside the round parentheses is the question it's the test that we are asking is this is this circumstance true and then inside the curly brace is the instructions that we will execute if this thing was true all right so inside my question i'm going to say key is down all right it's uppercase i on is and uppercase d on down and then another set of parentheses and i'm going to type the number 65 i'm going to explain where that comes from in a second and what instruction do i want well 65 is if i'm pressing the letter a so i'm going to want to move to the left which means i want to subtract from my x value all right, because I want X to tend closer to zero because the left boundary is zero. So I'm going to say player X is equal to whatever used to be in player X and let's subtract 10 off of that. So the number 65, where did that come from? This is uh, what's known as, um, well, I need to look up what's known as the ASCII table. And this is a, uh, a table with all the different values of all different characters and things within our computer. Um, and we can see here on the ASCII table that the uppercase A has a decimal number of 65. So if I look up my uh, the others that I'm going to use, the S and the D and the W, all right, so the D here is 68. That's the code that I need for, to detect if I'm pressing a D. Uh, the W is the number 87 and the s is the number 83 so let's come back to my code all right uh, i might actually put a little comment here all right uh, comments start by the by two slashes and then you can see in, at the moment vs code is making it green whatever i type after that javascript will ignore it it, in, it knows that the double slash means this is a comment that's just for my own help my so that I can understand what my code is doing. So I'm just going to type here letter A. All right, if key is down uh, 68, all right, that's the, that's the letter D. In that case, we're going to move to the right. So we're going to increase player X by 10. Uh, if he is down 87, All right, that is the letter W. Uh, this time we're going to move player Y. Uh, which way so we want to move player y up which means we want to get closer to zero so we're going to sub subtract 10 and if key down key is down uh, 83 wasn't it for s player y is equal to player y plus 10 all right and so now if i save this and go back to my web browser if I've done it correctly. Okay, and now I've got my circle that moves across the screen. Wahoo, fantastic. Uh, let's do, now I couldn't actually, I'm not actually testing that I'm not going off the screen and so uh, JavaScript will let me do that. 
uh, but it won't crash. Move it back the other way and you'll be able to bring it back. So that's the keyboard, but we're making a game that we want to work on mobile phones. And so we need to kind of simulate the mouse for that. Um, so basically the if we use the mouse controllers, then that effectively works for the phone touch as well. Um, for most purposes, it'll, it, it, for our purposes, it will work just fine. So I'm going to come back to the draw com command and I'm going to do a, um, all right, let, let's put in some mouse control in here as well. So if mouse pressed, all right, uh, what do we want to do? So let's take a look at our reference instructions and look up mouse pressed. Okay, so da, 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 calls a function when the mouse uh, is pressed. Do, 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 do. Um, and there was two mouse presses that came up, wasn't there? That's the function. Let's see. What I want is, yeah, mouse X, mouse Y. Okay. Oh, I th yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that's, I was just getting myself a little confused there. All right, mouse X tells us where the mouse currently is. Okay, so when the mouse is pressed, so the way I'm gonna do this is if the mouse is pressed on the left edge of my screen, I'm gonna move my player to the left. If the mouse is pressed to the right edge of my screen, I'm gonna move my player to the right. Um, I'm just gonna do the left and right for now um, because our game, really only needs moving left and right and then we'll add a jump later on as well all right so if mouse x is if it's to the left of my screen then how am i going to tell if it's to the left of my screen all right so this this is just going to be a number this is going to be the number of pixels um that my mouse click has happened so the way i'm going to test this is I'm going to see if it's in the leftmost third of my screen. And so I'm going to use my the width of my screen and take one third of it. So if my screen is a thousand pixels wide, then that's going to turn into 333. And so if I click the mouse anywhere between zero and 333, then I'm going to treat that as me wanting to move to the left. And so what I'm going to say here is player x is equal to player x minus 10. And then if for the right third of the screen, so if player x is larger than two thirds of the screen. Um, so window width times two divided by three. Player x is equal to player x plus 10. So let's give that a test, shall we? Uh, save, come back to the web browser. So I'm not using the keyboard. This time I am using the mouse. And if I click on the side, nothing's happening. If I click on this side, nothing's happening. Excellent. Okay, so what have I messed up there? Let me pause and take a quick look. Okay, so I've got that sorted uh, and I, had read the reference instructions wrong. What I want here instead of mouse pressed is mouse is pressed. And I'll show you how I checked that that was an error. Uh, so what I did is I added this command here, console log. And so we can just get JavaScript to dump a whole bunch of t messages to the screen and I was getting it. So I was checking to see if this was running basically because if this ran then this was going to produce this message for me that I could check and you know say hey mouse is pressed and here's what the value for mouse x is 
So let's take a look at the documentation because I'll quickly teach you how this worked. Uh, and when I was typing in the search box here, uh, and this list came up, okay, mouse pressed, as you can see here, it says that it's a method. A method is a, another term used for function. Right, and so mouse pressed only exists as a function. Uh, so it mean, and if we look at, click on it and look at the sample code, we can see here we've got the setup function. Um, do, 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 do. Yeah, and then here, okay, yeah, yeah, it's that's not really the example I want to show you. Uh, it's creating, it is creating other functions. Uh, if I, where was the other? Because mouse pressed appeared twice. Yeah, method in P5. Uh, yeah, so for now, I'd probably ignore the ones that say dot element and just go for the things that are inside P5. Okay, so if you're using this to check, ignore anything that has dot element. Uh, and so I'll come down to the other <laughs> mouse pressed All right, method in P5. This is the one that'll make more sense. All right, so we've got a draw function and then we, we can create a separate function called mouse pressed and um, p5 will run this function automatically if this if a function of this name exists it will run it automatically if the mouse is pressed otherwise the the, the way that I was trying to do it in my sample code here is I was checking it if the mouse was pressed inside my draw function. So rather than creating it as a separate function. So I could create it as a separate function and I might do that later on as well. Um, but right now I was doing it inside my draw loop. And so I wanted a way of checking that. Uh, and so the way that I diagnosed that when I just typed the word mouse and I was looking through this list and I saw here, okay, so there's the, there's the method mouse is pressed and then there's mouse is pressed which is a property and a property is another term for variable so it's something that we can look up and get a value out of all right uh, it's a boolean system variable and so it it is true if it's happening or false if it's not and you can see here um, as I'm pressing that the square turns into a circle uh, and so yeah we can check this inside our draw function all right so if the mouse is pressed then draw the ellipse otherwise draw the rectangle uh, and so that means in my sample code if the mouse is pressed output this message and check where it's pressed okay what's the x coordinate and and um, check that against the width of the screen so i can come back to my circle here and um, reload whoops uh, did I not save my changes? Ah, oh, <laughs> I was clicking in the middle of the screen. <laughs> not the left third or the right third. There you go. Um, now, let me show you where, the, where that console message is appearing because this is an important thing that we will be using a lot later on as well. If you right click and come down to inspect or you can come to your three dots and you should be able to find inspect there somewhere no more tools yeah and then developer tools which is appearing off on my screen uh, but if you right click inspect that bring right that brings you up into this mode here uh, it br or brings this sidebar uh, and if I move this across and come to the console option, you can see here, here is all my console messages, right? They're console messages, so they appear in the console. And so here's all the numbers of the X and Y coordinates of where I am clicking. And you can see that it keeps adding to this list every time I click. All right. Uh, and so, yeah, this is an important way of checking what's going on to help diagnose our errors. Um, if there is an error in my code, it will probably appear here as a big bright red error message as well. So I now have my keyboard control and I have mouse control happening in P5.js. And I think that's more than enough for this video. 
Okay, so error check all of that, and I'll see you next time.